Hello, everyone. My name is Saad Usmani. I'm the chief of myeloma service at the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in New York. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to bring to you a, um, a very interesting discussion um, in this Impact Echo project focused on um, disparities in, in myeloma care. Uh, it's around patient advocacy, and I'm joined by my wonderful colleague and, and friend, um, you know, Yalak Biru, who is um, the, currently the chief executive officer of the International Myeloma Foundation and a patient himself. So, you know, he's um, uh, been um, a wonderful patient advocate over the years and um, uh, supporting um, the myeloma research community, supporting other patients in um, advocating for uh, better care for myeloma patients, creating awareness about the disease. And, um, you know, it's, it's my privilege uh, and honor to have him here to, to discuss, um, you know, this, this particular topic. So welcome, um, uh, Yalak. Uh, you know, I, I would love uh, to hear a bit more about um, your initial journey as a myeloma patient and, and pearls of wisdom that you can share with us. Absolutely, Dr. Osmani. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for putting this uh, wonderful program together. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a myeloma patient, uh, but originally when I was diagnosed, I did not fit the mold of a, a typical myeloma patient. I was diagnosed at the age of 25 years old. Uh, it was actually a few months before my 26th birthday around Christmas time frame uh, when I was told I had stage three at that time, stage uh, three myeloma and I only have two or three years to live. Uh, fortunately for me, that was uh, about 26 years ago, and I hope I have uh, many more years to come. And throughout the year, I have been on many uh, treatments, but as you know, in 1995, early 96, the only available treatment was high-dose chemotherapy followed by high-dose chemotherapy and uh, a transplant. So I went through those first high-dose chemotherapies, uh, which you guys either don't give now or the younger physicians don't know what they are because they haven't used them. Uh, and I went into a five-year treatment-free interval uh, for until about 2000, 2001, and then the novel therapies uh, become, uh, start becoming available. Uh, while no one really wants to have myeloma, uh, in my opinion, this is the best time ever to have myeloma. There are over a dozen approved treatments and uh, a few uh, that are in the pipeline and hopefully uh, they will soon be approved as well. So that's really my story in a book. No, it's it's uh, um, a much more interesting story than that. I I, I... Um, I've heard you, you know, chat about, you know, the, the challenges you had, uh, you know, you're right, you, you did not face, uh, you know, you weren't the typical myeloma patient, you were very young. Um, and, uh, you know, by, by virtue of having trained in Arkansas, I'm one of the few quote unquote millennials who has utilized the old fashioned chemotherapies. And, and so you have seen the development of myeloma treatments over the years. Um, you know, going from the conventional chemotherapies to, you know, small molecules and now immunotherapies and, you know, what you're describing as the best time, um, you know, to, to be a myeloma patient, I think is right for, for, you know, several reasons. And one thing that I want to point out is, is the, you know, patient advocacy piece, you know, it was you and a lot of colleagues, uh, you know, and, and peers who actually um, took this upon themselves to be part of the solution, to try to you know, help drive that innovation and, and be part of the research efforts. Um, what prompted your engagement as a patient advocate? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I never, and I still don't consider myself a patient advocate or even an advocate, but as someone uh, who wants to pay it forward, knowing that all of the improvements in outcome over the last two decades or so came because of patients that have traveled this path before me. So I want to do the same for those who are going to come uh, uh, after me. It's it kind of, I call myself like a, the baton carrier. I 
accepted the baton from the previous patients and I want to carry it as long and as far as possible and then give it to uh, the next set of patients uh, who uh, end up coming after me. But as I learn to advocate for myself and say, uh, I don't want that treatment because it's going to keep me away from work uh, for an extended period of time. Or at that time, if you took treatment A, treatment B may be out of uh, purview for you. Uh, as I want to uh, discuss more about quality of life, the type of quality of life I want, uh, as I learned more, uh, the best way to engage with my clinicians in the healthcare system, uh, advocating for others and representing their voice uh, became a natural extension. And But over the last several years, uh, I have been able to work with industry partners, with the NCI, NIH. Uh, I am a patient advocate with ECOG. Uh, and now I am part of the patient advocate for uh, FDA. Uh, and now, as you mentioned earlier, I'm also privileged uh, to be the chief executive officer of the International Myeloma Foundation and really marry my passion and my lifelong experience in business to be able to give back uh, more meaningfully to the myeloma, the myeloma community. Um, how have you found your partnership with your clinical care team to help you during that process, Yelak? Yeah, we, we hear the word uh, shared decision-making uh, a lot in, uh, in advocacy. And the way I see that is not just you as a clinician knowing me as a myeloma carrier, but you as a clinician knowing me as Yelak the person who knows me as uh, at that time, somebody who was going to graduate school, was newly married, wants to go back and see his parents in Ethiopia. Now, as somebody who's advocating, who wants to travel, and so looking at me more holistically and me understanding what you bring to the table as a clinician, as a researcher, as an advocate on my behalf into the research community, so I really consider it uh, a mutual uh, relationship uh, that we build over time. The more you know me, the more I know you, it becomes less of a transaction, but more of a relationship. You are hitting a very important point. You know, I think, um, you know, be, be, being, being a physician and a doctor, um, you know, one of the things that that I truly enjoy is is building those relationships because, um, you know, in the end, you know, if you look at life as a whole, you know, that's what it's all about, uh, building relationships. And and, um, you know, I, I do see this, um, you know, as as one of the challenges, you know, in, in the field in general is, uh, you know, how do you um, help address um, our patients? care goals and their life goals um, and and create some sort of a balance you know as as you go through um, their disease management plan um, and and I think you know it's it's a very important lesson that you learn um, as, a, as a doctor especially in, in the field of oncology uh, because this is a long-term relationship it's a marathon um, you know, and and at one point, you know, I, I I'm 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 very hopeful that we will cure this disease, um, um, you know, and, and we can talk about all of those things. But for many patients, you know, um, there are going to be other goals that you know are are going to be more important at certain you know time points in their lives, and that may not align with the best treatment options that they they you know that may be available to them so so how do you kind of balance all of that is is an art more than science and it also evolves over time right dr Osmani, uh when you are newly diagnosed and you know that you respond to a particular type or class of drugs and then uh later on in your myeloma journey uh, when and if you end up becoming or your myeloma becoming 
uh, refractory to some of those drugs. And also for me, you know, young, 25 years old, going into graduate school, the quality of life expectancy I had at that time is different than now in my early 50s, where I am getting solicitation from ARP and other other uh, <laughs> bodies. So the evolution in that long-term relationship, as you mentioned, I think is really important uh, in uh, increasing patient satisfaction, but also, I think, improving outcome. Yeah. So, so with that in mind, you know, um, if patients want to, you know, champion themselves or, or be advocates, um, uh, what do you think would be the best practices, you know, that you've observed, that you've, you have adopted, you've, uh, you know, seen um, other patients adopt? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So also when you talk uh, medical oncology, you know, there are specialization, right? In patient advocacy, there are also, in my opinion, specialization. You can specialize in the education area. You can specialize in research area. You can specialize advocating for policy, or you can become a general advocate, right? Sim similar to a general hematologist versus a myeloma doctor. Uh, my work as a patient and uh, research advocate is to shine the light on clinical trials from the patient perspective, right? I never go to uh, a meeting and say, uh, this is a scientific uh, reason for why. I want to understand that, but I want to bring the patient perspective in terms of uh, quality of life, patient reported outcome, and other ways of being able to measure not just efficacy, but also uh, the ancillary or if you want to call it secondary outcomes as you design uh, clinical trials. Uh, and my goal is really, at, at least right now, is not necessarily to be cured, but to live as long as possible with the utmost quality of life possible. So how do I package that into access advocacy, into research advocacy, into educational advocacy, I think is really important. And uh, you can be a reluctant advocate like I was, but as you learn more, the fact that you show up and you are among others who kind of look up to you because you have lived as long as you have with my mom, uh, is energizing and invigorating. So start small, uh, decide your level of comfort. But as uh, uh, one of the things for me, I think uh, if I can bring it up, is there's also survivor skill, right? There have been a do dozens and dozens of patients I have known over the years that are no longer here. And Patients like me say, okay, why are they not here and I am here? And it is a, a want, a need, a, a privilege to be able to pay it back. And so uh, really, that's how I package the uh, advocacy uh, work that I do. A very comprehensive um, answer, Yelak. And I think, you know, you bring in, um, you know, the uh, the the more humanistic and, and emotional aspect of this as well and and why you know advocacy becomes um, um, important um, because you know you also feel a part of a broader community um, you know where where all of us have specific roles um, and 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 we're working in unison towards that goal so speaks so well about you know what we're trying to do here as part of this impact echo project is highlighting the disparities, um, you know, in in care um, given to uh, you know patients, um, um, you know, from from uh, African American descent, um, and trying to elevate um, the level of care uh, for those patients, you know, increase literacy about the importance of clinical trials, and also um, you know get a you know them involved in that process. I think there's always, um, you know, this this historic reluctance. You know, rightly so because of all the 
uh, stigmata associated with uh, with the research. So, um, you know, it's with, with all of those things, you know, what would your advice be for physicians in the community, um, you know, who are taking care of myeloma patients from all walks of life, from different races, ethnicities, how to best engage them um, as, as advocates for themselves, as advocates for others? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, uh, Dr. Osmani. Uh, I recently heard of a facility where uh, once they tell a patient he or she has myeloma, they offer them the opportunity to meet with other myeloma patients who are trained to help with a newly diagnosed. That, this clinic, uh, in my opinion, has made patient advocates part of their team. Can you imagine then as a result of that, the trust this newly diagnosed person has in her doctor in that treatment facility and their ability to be able to be uh, cared for by that facility, but also the relationship that they will be able uh, to build as a result. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, in my opinion, engaged patients have better treatment outcomes and are better partners in their care. So engaging with an advocate, helping educate a patient or mentoring an advocate pays back multiple folds. That's some of the things that I really like and admire about our myeloma doctors is your willingness to uh, not be good in the work that you do, but also have that mindset that I need to mentor not only other doctors, but also uh, myeloma patients. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Yelak, for joining us and sharing your journey, thoughts, and wisdom. Um, and I hope uh, all the pearls that you've shared with us will be beneficial to our guests and listeners. Um, and together we can improve the outcomes of all patients um, uh, with myeloma, regardless of where they're coming from, um, you know, regardless of their race and ethnicity. Um, thank you for your participation and thanks to our guests and listeners for joining in.